So, after literal years, and then a few more months in the middle, Invincible Season 2 is finally fully here for us. It took so long, in fact, that the season started, it stopped, I waited for several weeks, then I got bored, then I wanted, and then I got the three massive compendiums telling the entire story, then I read all of those compendiums from front to back, and then I waited another month on top of that for the second half of the season to finally come out. Granted, those compendiums are basically all dialogue except maybe one or two major moments in the story with internal monologues, but also they are ridiculously massive. If you stack them on top of one another, they're the size of a medium shipping box. But anyway, reading the entire story of Invincible in between opportunities for me to watch it really changed my perspective on the story. Obviously, first of all, I now know exactly what is going to happen, and I'm no longer sitting down with the primary desire to know what comes next in each episode. The second part of this is that any adjustments or changes or liberties the show takes stick out a lot more to me, because I'm aware of them. This could be both good and bad, but in most cases, it feels pretty good. What I want to talk about are these adjustments the series makes from the comics. Perhaps understanding why these adjustments were made and what might make them successful and warranted rather than something else. I think being able to do this not only helps me appreciate the show more, but also allows me to understand what makes for a compelling and engaging story in general. This also selfishly shows that I am not against changes to source material that I'm fond of, I just don't like changes that serve no narrative purpose or wind up actively taking away from the themes and core ideas of a story. <coughs> Percy Jackson. <coughs> the best possible example I can think of in Invincible Season 2 comes from a minor character, actually. It's Donald. In the comics, at least from my memory of the comics, since, like I said, there were a lot of them, he's not really much of anything. He's just really your standard bureaucratic second-in-command who is eventually revealed to be a cyborg. He doesn't really get much to do or really a ton of agency of his own. He is always relegated to being a background player who might occasionally have some sort of linchpin action going on once in a blue moon. But in the show, Donald gets an arc over the course of the second season. Why? Several reasons, really. The first being that, with the Reanimen plotline being moved up through seasons 1 and 2, Rick is back in the picture much sooner than he was in the comics. This happens to align pretty well with Donald. Donald's umpteenth journey to and from the land of the dead, so why not make use of that? Because when you're a storyteller, it's your job to find the puzzle pieces whose ridges mirror one another and fit them together to create something that's a bit larger and a bit more complex. So we get Donald struggling with his own mortality, his own life, his own nebulous concept of personhood and being. What is he? What is his soul? Simultaneously, Rick is having his own crisis. From the trauma of being experimented on, he finds himself unable to accept his new reality. He hates what he's become, what he's been made into, and he can't seem to accept himself as he is now. Without his consent, he was butchered and modified, helpless to all of it. His own skin, to him at least, is an ever-present reminder of the horrors that he's been through. Eventually, though, they each come to their own conclusion. Donald discovers his past lives and deaths and confronts them head on. He's met with the truth about himself. Yes, he's died, and yes, this ship of Theseus is far, far, far away from the one that initially left port, but it's still the ship of Theseus. He's still Donald, and he always will be, because persisting through every physical body of Donald's that's been wiped out time and time again is his mental fortitude. His morals and ethics and will and drive to do good for others are far more immutable and incorruptible than any body of his, human or robot, could ever be. And he finds a comfort in that, because those ever-present ideas and attitudes and beliefs, those things that drive him to act the way that he does, that's Donald. That's who he is and who he always will be. He's no more his hand or his leg or his head than he is his brown suit. He is the sum of his choices. He is what he puts out into the world. That is Donald. Rick, meanwhile, is in despair. He can't find his way past the damage that's been done to him, and William is not necessarily up to the task of helping Rick through it. So it comes down to Donald to quite literally talk Rick off the ledge. And, beautifully, he does. His words are poignant and inspiring, and enough for Rick to see another way. Not only that, but his words are true. They're true to Donald and to Rick and to us, the audience. We are also our actions and our thoughts and beliefs, not necessarily just our physical selves. What we put out into the world for those around us will outlast our bodies a hundred times over. Donald knows this and believes this, and he sees the beauty in it. And in a speech that gives a similar feeling to one of the most famous Superman moments in DC Comics, Donald shares this belief with someone in need of it. 
the belief grows and inspires, and it even saves Rick. And none of this was in the original comic run of Invincible. Hell, none of it needed to be in the show, necessarily. If you drop it, the main plotline really doesn't get impacted much at all. I know because it wasn't there to begin with, and season two still ended somewhere that's an exact recreation of where it is in the comics. The decision to give further depth and characterization to the people of Invincible's world can only make us care more about the story. I'm an echo of some of my recent reviews here, but this stopping to smell the roses, this intimacy and focus on smaller parts of the story, make the bigger parts that much better, that much more captivating and visceral. We don't need to cut essential moments of characterization for the sake of pacing. If anything, we can expand on them, give them more room to breathe and grow like what was done with Mark in the final episode of season two. Yes, the iconic moment of him thinking Angstrom was stronger was adapted very nearly one-to-one, -one, but it was given a bit more air, I feel like. Like I said earlier, most of the comics have no internal monologue. This is the case when Mark is alone after this fight too, if I remember correctly. He's left mumbling and muttering to himself in this desert wasteland, though it's not quite as extensive as in the show, in my opinion. In the show, Mark is given more room to spiral. He's given more time with his thoughts to pour out. While he's in this vulnerable state, it allows us to feel for him more. Each moment he dwells on his actions and clings to them drives things home even more for us. We better understand his feelings Fear, both of what he could become and of what he is. We understand why he flashes back to certain moments like he does. We hear the words of Cecil and Nolan and even Mark himself get twisted to be given new meanings. Meanings that give us the same knot in our stomach that Mark gets from them. The knot he can't seem to undo that lingers in him for every moment that's left of him on screen in the second season. So at the end of the day, as big as the set piece battle is, that's not what makes the show feel big. Not in the story or in our minds. It matters so much because of what it does to Mark. How it makes him reconsider all that he is and has the horrifying potential to be. It's not a turning point because it's a big fight. It's a big fight because it's a turning point for Mark as a character. That's impactful storytelling. It's why this season, at least from the perspective of narrative, has been so well received. It knows what matters and how to make an audience care. It's not going to cut off core moments between Mark and Amber or cut down the kindling of Alan and Nolan's relationship in prison. It won't quickly force Mark and Eve to a preset destination without having us see them do the work of traveling there first, because those kinds of changes only serve to hollow things out. They make for a lifeless narrative, one that would pale in comparison to its source material. Some shows do do this, and that lifeless feeling is ever-present in those ones. The empty feeling, the meaningless feeling, the disconnected feeling. Things happen to happen and struggle to connect with you no matter how badly you'd want them to for every moment that you're watching. And yes, the second season of Invincible does deserve its fair share of criticism. For one, it's releasing at a snail's pace, and that would be fine were the animation to reflect as much, but the animation does not do that. Not only does it not do that, but it painfully doesn't do that at times. Which is a real shame, because once the comics found their groove, their art was absolutely beautiful. So, in a way, reading them curses you with knowledge, as you know what the Thraxa fight could have been and should have been, and need to compare it to what was given. But hopefully, all that can be forgiven when the fundamentals are there. Because at the end of the day, we're here for the story of Invincible, aren't we? We're here for the emotions and the feelings it can bring us right? And season two definitely delivered that, so it does deserve praise. Just, you know, step up the art in season three, maybe. And try to get it out before I qualify for social security, too. So, it's a 3.5 out of 5 stars for me, carried very much so by its great characters and great story. Until next time.